I get a real kick saying that. It is Tuesday, April 8th. With me is Councilmember, the Honorable Councilmember Jose Sar, and we are expecting Councilmember Weiss, but I believe we can start with the agenda. We have several items that we could move on, but we also have with us a volunteer of sorts. Mr. Ricardo Lara, who has been appointed by our Mayor Antonio Villagosa to the Planning Commission for the term ending June 30th, 2011. Mr. Lara is a resident of the Council District 14. Mr. Lara, would like to come to the microphone? And as you can tell, folks, the acoustics are not the best in this room. So we really need to have a conversation. Please take it outside. And uh, when you do come up to the microphone, give us your name and address. Uh, keep your eye on the clock for two minutes. Not you, Mr. Lauda. Oh, okay. okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> but we do have two minutes for the speakers. And uh, again, we appreciate your courtesy. Mr. Lauda, good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Can you just bring the microphone close to you? First, I want to welcome you to the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Um, I know that as a commissioner, there's a lot of time, and, and so I thank you for your care and concern for our great city. Can you share a little bit about yourself with us? Sure. Um, Councilmember, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I was born and raised in East Los Angeles. Um, uh, ra actually born in Boyle Heights, but raised in East Los Angeles, I should say. Uh, and I went to our public schools in the East Side, proud uh, homeowner in Boyle Heights. And, um, you know, my breath of my work comes from working in the state legislature, working in the state legislature, uh, everything from being a legislative aide to a chief of staff. And so I bring uh, roughly 10 years of policy work in the state and I'm very eager to be part of this commission and I know that it's very exciting times in in this department and so I'm eager to uh, lend my my breadth of knowledge and experience in statewide policy now bring it bring it to a local level and ensuring that uh, I bring that perspective as well so are there certain topics or subject matter that you engaged in that lends itself to the planning process or land use process in your capacity in Sacramento? Absolutely. I was fortunate enough to work uh, in the last, for the last housing bond in which we worked on affordable housing issues. Of course, that's been a major issue in the city of LA. I was able to create programs and create the incentives that we uh, so often talk about to help developers create affordable housing in our communities. And so the, the other issue that I was uh, fortunate to work with is to be able to have a breadth of experience in terms of the uniqueness of the state, working to deal with industrial land use, working on rural areas, urban areas. And so we have all these unique characteristics in the city that I could bring the knowledge of implementing sort of statewide programs and now bringing them to a more local level. I mean, as you said, we are in a very exciting time, a time with a lot of energy in the air. And I believe that's great because it brings people out to community meetings. And sometimes we hear in the press and the media only some information. And then sometimes it gets twisted into absolutes when in fact this city is so unique, every neighborhood has its own challenges. but through our director, Gail Goldberg, and the community plan process, we are in a historic place where we are asking the communities, how do you want to define yourself? Where do you see housing? Where do you want to preserve the neighborhoods? What neighborhoods can we view for the sake of historic preservation? And start connecting the dots with our transportation needs. So we are literally asking community members 
to be able to have the dialogue in a calm manner that speaks to what's best for that neighborhood, for that, for that area, for, that, for our city. So I'm hoping with your vision and understanding of the intricacies at the state level that we could drill down to specific areas throughout the city because this city is so unique in all of its different uh, histories of, of each, each uh, community. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and I hope that we can continue working together. I'm sure we will. And I'd like to ask Council Wissar if you'd like to make any observations, being that he's a constituent. <laughs> I was going to joke and ask if he voted for me. He voted for me. But I, I won't ask. <laughs> Don't do no. it. Mr. Lara, I, I have uh, known you for some time, and I think you're going to be a great addition to this commission. I think this is a, a commission you are being appointed to uh, has got, brought for, forward uh, some very important policy uh, proposals that the city has has moved forward on, and I think it's great to see this type of activity from this planning commission. Uh, and particularly, I, I'm excited that you live in a community like Bow Heights, a, a community that uh, is seeing a lot of public and private investment. Uh, and in terms of the public investment, uh, I'm excited that after years of, of very little of it, we're finally getting to see it. We have a new high school going up. Uh, we have a new police station. And that's all going down the Gold Line corridor uh, where we will see the new rail line open up in the year 2009. Uh, and certainly in terms of private, uh, we're working to move forward the Sears project on uh, Olympic and Soto and a number of other proposals that have been um, asked uh, that are in the pipeline. But I raise this to say that I think you're in the, in, in, you live in a neighborhood that is a microcosm of what's happening throughout the rest of the city, but with a lot of activity. And particularly for low-income communities like Bow Heights, um, you, uh, I think, have the perspective as proposals, policies, and decisions you have to make on individual projects that perspective you will bring forward, I think, is going to be a very... Uh, valued one and so I um, welcome you and uh, wish you luck and uh, I know you are already very busy uh, giving back to the community through your work everyday work and now taking this on adds to that but uh, we really appreciate you lending your skills and talent and experience to this commission thank you thank you council member appreciate it any last comments no oh, just like I said earlier thank you so much council member Reyes welcome. and Wisar I'm very excited to begin this new endeavor and to be part of uh, to give back to the great city that I love so much. So thank you so much. I think there's just some issues with forms with city ethics that have to be turned in. I understand that we uh, he does have to complete them. Have you completed your ethics forms? Yes. Okay. Okay. As as they will agendize us on the next Tuesday, and Great. I'll double check to make sure those are sent to the file. Fantastic. So we will see you in the horseshoe in a few okay. days. Welcome. Thank you. Good luck to you. So it's been confirmed, Mr. Laura. Uh, as recommended by the Plum Committee. Okay, there are several items that we can hopefully move on and uh, correct if I'm wrong, but there has been some changes on a few items. Um, my understanding that, um, I'm not sure if Councilman Weiss wants to speak to item number two, but that we, would, we could refer to the Planning Department and the City Attorney. Number three, um, we will hold, we'll call that special. Uh, number four, I understand that we can continue that for one week. Our time frames allow for that. Is that accurate? Item number four? Continue one week. There's a request from the planning department and the applicant. Okay, are our parties in sync with that request? Yeah, there are a few, there is one or two speaker cards. I don't know if they, since they're here, if they still would like to speak. I know at least Mr. McQuiston has decided to wait till next week. Okay, so both Mr. Weiss and Mr. McQuiston, we can continue this for one week, and we can, uh, we can hear from you then, so I appreciate your cooperation. Item number five, we can put on the consent calendar, seeing no cards on five. Six we'll call special. In so much that we do have some cards. Item number seven, we can put on the consent calendar. 
See no cards there. On number eight, we can continue to July 8th in Plum and July 23 in Council. Should we live so long? Let's see, item number nine. We are calling special. I don't see any cards on that. So we'll bring that up for discussion, for clarification. I had uh, gotten an email from the applicant that said it was supposed to be continued, but I don't have any evidence to that effect. I know it was coming from a prior week. Um, we do have a little time if you'd like to continue to the 15th, unless there are parties here. Uh, are we expecting Councilmember Wise? Yes, but we are expecting to We will continue this item? Okay, so item number nine, we will continue. Okay, it'll be continued to the 15th. In the 15th? Month. Okay. Hey, okay. it's great to have staff here. <laughs> item number 10, we will call special and so much we have cards. Item number 11, also with cards. 12, uh, we won't have a report today. So thank you, Director Goldberg. I know she was here earlier. And uh, 13, we don't have a report as well. So items we've called continued and referred to planning. We can move on those with a second. Thank you, sir. So, Roberto, where does that take us? Uh, that would be item three, Councilman. The status report on the mixed use initiatives. Yes, I, I wanted to focus a little on this because it's an important issue regarding the uh, planning department work with the, um, the whole notion of, of mixed use development with schools. So can you just give us a quick report and then we can move on to directives. Yeah, um, James Lumenfeld from the planning department. Um, there's been a lot of efforts to try to figure out how to do mixed use optimally or in the greatest numbers and um, we've done, I don't know, so many things. Uh, I just want to go over a few because I think at the, at the end of the day it's really, really difficult to do it despite all the interest in trying to do it and I think at least my observation from having looked at it from all these different ways. I think Council and are <laughs> involved in a lot of it. Um, th it's really the legal part that ends up to be so difficult and um, requires so much brain damage to accomplish because while many um, shared uses of parks and schools or libraries and schools um, can happen conceptually um, because of things like the rules about bonding and the timetable the school district is under to perform and the different milestones of bonds and um, the legal uh, documents required at the end of the day to for two agencies, two giant bureaucracies to share facilities and go to their respective um, approval agencies, that, that that's really the difficult part. But, but Jane, are we in a position, being that as legislators, the city level and legislators at the state level, can we give ourselves a chance to promote or craft a language that makes it possible to achieve our goals? I think the answer, um, we, we formed several committees starting in about 2001 when the first phase of the school district bonds happened and there was money available to do projects um, that w with the school district and the city. We formed a committee with every agency and the community college district, the school district, every department in the city. We investigated all the impediments. We wrote a report. We went to the council. Then Assembly Member Goldberg, you remember this, I'm sure, said, asking the same exact question, she said, what can I do at the state to um, fix legislation so we can do more of them, do it better. And she convened all these people, flew down department heads from Sacramento and formed a lot of committees to look at all the, all the impediments. And at the end of that, it was maybe a year and a few months process, um, there, she concluded, or everybody concluded, there were no legal impediments. It wasn't the legislation that was the problem. And uh, it was just the difficulty of getting all the different 
parts of bureaucracies together to do such a thing, but there weren't legal impediments. She did one bill, because her, her point was, I would carry legislation if you all tell me what is, uh, what, what to carry. And we did write one bill, which we all, your office, um, we all worked on together with her. She carried the governor's sign, and um, it had to do with cities having the ability to um, uh, use eminent domain when uh, the school district would take housing in order to build a school. The city would have the power to use eminent domain, but then um, transfer the properties that it would take by eminent do domain to housing developers, for profit or nonprofit. That was a power we didn't have, which we created by that bill. But we haven't used it collectively anywhere to do to implement that. But it was the only piece of legislation anybody could identify that could facilitate this. So in recommendations two and six that I'm going to put forth, my hope is that in looking at these recommendations, we can chisel down this big monster into maybe a couple of cases or examples or demonstration projects that can mm -hmm. demonstrate a different will or put to the test the reasons why we can't do things. I mean, we can't give up. My, my, that's my point. And like for recommendation number two, instruct planning staff to report back to Plum as possible, as soon as possible, with analysis of the cost, benefits, and related issues utilizing unused city airspace for school purposes. So we know we don't have all the low hanging fruit is gone. I mean, they've gobbled up most of the land that could have been used, has been bought. But we have a lot of dormant airspace that the, we control because of our properties, et cetera. Juxtaposed to these residential centers where you have these high densities, mm -hmm. if we can put together a scenario that focuses on, on, on a test or, or a demonstration project, or maybe it changes, and this is my wishful thinking, it changes this whole reasons of why we can't do things. I and think for put, charter schools, especially, that might for be charter easier schools, than the LAUSD schools. So again, it's just understanding our capacity as a city mm -hmm. to leverage what we can control. And I think that's what recommendation number two is trying to get at. Recom recommendation number six, instruct planning and city attorney staff to report back on all Okay, legal, financial, administrative regulations that create impediments, and that's what you're just talking about. Within a single site or a single building, so again, it's not the umbrella approach as to why things are stopping us, but let's look at one site and just kind of drill through those legal issues um, and administrative regulations that are impediments. And I know I'm pushing hard on this, but uh, there's going to come a time when our council districts, we're going to have to um, make some serious decisions. And for middle schools, for example, there's a time when they're saying we need to take some of these residential pockets to make room for a middle school. And, and that's, I think, a last resort if we don't understand this potential. So in collaboration with the LAUSD, Guy Mahala, Chief Facilities Executive of Construct Planning with the assistance of the City Attorney to report back on 45 days on the matters above instructions, especially as it pertains to outstanding pending issues to address the, the, the portable seats and 13 opportunity sites. So, because remember, when, when Guy came, Mr. Mahala came here, he was saying, okay, we build all these schools, but we have all these portable facilities sitting on in schoolyards, he mentioned some outrageous numbers that are still there. So it's like we're not causing relief where it's really needed as much as we've been doing. Uh, so that begs the question to recommendation number two and six, if we can come up with something. And if you'd like to meet in my office, we can kind of go through it. I'd love to have Council saw work with us on this as a former school board member president and give us some uh, advice and guidance on this as well. Generally speaking, I think the timing is right for us to get more creative about using the limited space that we have available in the city. As many of you know, about six years ago, there was a huge 
ups, uh, demand for us to build more schools after 30 years of not building any schools. And about six years ago, we finally put a plan together to build 160 new schools in the next eight years at that time. And it's been very successful, as you know. But the debates that you would normally see about what's the better use of some property weren't really there because everybody was supporting the construction of schools. So even in very densely populated areas like Council District 1 where I worked with Mr. Reyes when I was on the school board, you know, he was very supportive of us building uh, some schools in some areas where there was a huge demand for housing to be built, but at the same time, Mr. Reyes recognized that and was able to say, well, let's allow the school district to move forward and build the necessary schools. Uh, but now that we've opened up about 65 or so schools uh, that, um, that uh, uh, long awaited, uh, or, or it, it's the, the need for more schools has lessened a little bit. I mean, the need is still there, but the, uh, the urgency is not as high as it used to be. So, uh, but we still have the issue of very little available space in these highly densely populated areas, and I think this is the way to go for the future. And part of why we didn't do this, even when there was the urgency, is that in the, the you have the Belmont Learning Complex where they try to build a huge commercial center with a school, and that went different directions for various different reasons. And so the mentality at the district for a long time was, don't bother us with anything else. Don't come talk to us that you want to do joint use with housing or commercial or anything else. Our goal and our mission is to build schools, and so get out of our way. That's what we're going to do. But I think that now that with that success of opening up 60 new schools, um, they're a little bit more open over at the school district to say, okay, let's get more creative about how we move forward now. So I think both the urgency to open new schools schools has lessened, and secondly, um, now with that success uh, the, and the lessening of what happened at the Belmont Learning Complex, there's a, a feeling at the school district that they're more open to do this. And certainly from our side, given the shortage of housing and what's under our purview and responsibility, it makes sense to talk to them about how we move forward. They have money through the bonds. <laughs> so. On our side, it's more of a regulatory thing and how we make it possible. They have the money and the regulatory power. We just have the regulatory power, don't have any money in our housing trust fund, but, uh, you know, so we just have to make it easier. It, it's easier on our side to kind of just deal with the rules and regulations and how we make that possible and then invite the private sector, I guess, to move forward and make it easier for them to work with the school district to make that possible. Right. In terms um, of, Councilman, uh, one, I'm sorry. one other thing on that, two, two things on that note. One is we can use housing trust fund dollars, and right now we right. are doing a project in CD13 right at the edge of your district um, in Glassell Park right. where the school district owns land and on uh, community design center is doing um, a housing project on yeah. their land and an early ed center and parking, so there's joint use and they are using trust fund dollars. But um, one thing that happened in the course of the few years of working on that is you know, the well, we had the bond money, the cost of everything, I don't know, quintupled or something, so that they had to even go back to the board to um, get additional funds because by the time it, everything was ready, mm -hmm. the costs were prohibitive. The, the, um, when that project started, it was in District 1 before yeah, we right, District right. Right. And I'm bringing that up because it's now yeah. seven years How later. Long it takes. And right. so are they breaking ground yet? Uh, n not yet, but but um, again, in there, there was so much legal work to do, transferring property using a co ed code section that had never been used before, and the lawyers took many, I don't know, two years to all agree that that was um, okay to do. So it's not legal impediments, it's just two giant bureaucracies trying to do yeah. something innovative. So we, uh, but can I say one other please. really positive news that I think is, is really useful that's a completely different direction? Um, and I, this, again, Councilman Wieser was on the board when we did all this, but we applied for a grant in the planning department to look at um, many of the post-war schools that could be reconfigured to free up space, which would be net new space that none of us have called space before mm -hmm. and where we can build housing. And now, and, we, and I have this, I'm going to give you this, I think you've seen this report, but this was the um, product of the grant. And then um, subsequent to this, the school district formed a division, which is now looking at um, dozens and dozens of school sites where w they can do this. And we've been discussing with the state Department of Housing 
uh, Housing Community Development to um, look at some of the bond money um, in the recent housing bond to use for pilot projects. And this, you know, there's a incredible amounts of opportunity. They're all over the city, everybody's districts, to build housing, um, work with communities and um, something, maybe not only housing, community centers, health care, whatever, community assets on land that um, where the school can be improved and new freed up land can occur. So that I think is about the most promising thing and in a way easier than trying to marry the bureaucracies as we've been doing. So the Polytechnic High School, yeah. the $250,000 right. Cal Trans Grant. Right, that's this. That's what you're referring to? I'm gonna to? give you copies of that. For okay. And that will give us a sense of, of how we could yeah. be more efficient with our time without yeah. breaking our skulls. And I think building hundreds of housing units of all kinds, hundreds. Okay, okay. great. Is the, um, the Joint Use Task Force that uh, was organized by Senator Jackie Goldberg, does that still meet? No, we had many task forces. We had, um, <laughs> there was one. Uh, early, starting in 2001, there was one that um, the, count, the um, committee in, on neighborhoods, um, education neighborhoods committee formed. We met for a long time, um, a year, about a year, um, with that that task force. The same with the same goal, Jackie Goldberg one. We met for a year and a few months, um, looking at that with a lot of state um, department heads. As I said, um, we had written several, the CLA's written a report, the CAO's written a report, we've written several reports from the planning department. Um, we've had several projects like Glassell Park, the grant, um, a, a project in Council District 9, one in um, Council District 4, where there's been trading of land, our land, our city park land, for school district land or reconfiguration of schools to um, use both uh, agencies' properties to have school and park, school, and the CD9 one. Um, there was a, a very inefficient park and a very inefficient school site. And when we traded the lands, there became softball fields, basketball courts, all joint use for the community in a really, really park poor area. And most of those task forces were focused more on joint use of recreational space. Right, or um, that was kind uh, of the community push. centers. It wasn't necessarily housing or commercial and, and a school, right? Most of those were Mostly. kind of joint use of, of... Not for any real reason, I don't think, yeah. other than it was frequently the schools were near parks, and so it was sort of easier to get a little more open space that way. But there was no uh, limitation on looking at any kind of community assets. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate your hard work on this. I, uh, we can't let this go. I don't want to note and file this. If we can follow up with those two recommendations and anything we can do in between to stimulate a more efficient and hopefully timely results, uh, it, it would, I think, would uh, bode well with, with our constituents throughout the city. Okay. But I, but I think the point you touched upon, I just want to make one final point. I think the impetus for the discussion that we're hearing now and the interest from the school district is mm -hmm. more focused on those <clears throat> existing sites that are probably underutilizing their space at their schools to say, hey, wait a minute, there's a huge demand for housing yes. in this area, yes. and you have this school district property there that is not being used to its optimum level. Old facilities probably could, the district doesn't have enough money for maintenance to, uh, for, to, to uh, bring it up to, speed and modernize it, not enough money to modernize it, so let's just get a developer there who probably has some, could leverage some additional funding to help the school district with their modernization dollars upgrade the right. school, modernize the school, make better use of that space. And that, I think that's what's driving this right now. In and the in past, cases, like I mentioned, in the past it was more like how do we use our yes, parks and playgrounds true, together, true. things like that. In some it's cases a new phase also, of this whole joint use. The school district was renting space right near a place where they owned underutilized land, which was, you know, so part of the thing we did in the grant was show how even economically with pro formas, you know, the school district w could, ha you know, save money from doing, reconfiguring their sites as well, not only do community, um, you know, improve communities, but also even for their own self-interest, they could do better. Yeah, and in the past when we did have uh, Gratz and uh, the new primary center that mm -hmm. we did there across the street, 
I think the thinking at that time was let's use the school district money to help housing. Yeah. Now it's the opposite. It's let's use housing to help the school district in modernizing some of their schools. Okay. Well, that being said, thank you, Jane, and uh, hopefully we got the two. We'll get the two recommendations to you. Okay. And uh, thanks for all your hard work and uh, the whole staff that's been behind you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Noel Weiss, you've got two minutes. Name and address, please. Thank you. Just to add a little bit uh, more to this debate to cover an alternative, Mr. Alarcon last year uh, introduced a motion sitting, although I was at his committee today, promised me May 13th now he's going to actually schedule this to establish, at least this is a study, but hopefully it will be more than that by the time we're done, a city department of education. Now we talked about this in, when Janice Hahn had that project, Robert Bisno, Mr. Lincoln Place in his district, wouldn't it be great, I said, when Mr. whatever the guy's name from the school district was, wouldn't it be great if the city could charter schools, we could basically take care of that problem because this gentleman came here and basically told all you guys this is where it's going to be, you know, love it or leave it. Now I think th there's a Circumstance here in terms of meeting your commitment, Mr. Reyes, if we, if you, if we could basically find a way, and I think there is a way, to focus, execute on the idea of getting the city to charter public schools, to authorize public schools. It would require a constitutional amendment, require an amendment of the charter, but you know what? That kind of competition, I think from Mr. Weezar's perspective, unless he's changed his mind since last time we visited this issue, you know what? The competition for that public dollar would, I think, generate uh, efficiencies on both sides, and with planning tied in, I think you can get what you want to get. And number two, as far as dollars are concerned, if it's charter schools, the money's there. Greg Smith got, what, $50 million for Sierra Canyon, a private school in the valley, to basically build a high school. Um, the CDD, I mean, the, those people over in the Industrial Development Department love this, because that's how they make their money. That, they're self-sustaining. It's one of the few city agencies that's self-sustaining, because they, they basically support off of the money and the bonds that they're able to raise. So I would just encourage that focus, if you're looking at trying to get this accomplished rather than go through traditional means. Thank you. And, and support Mr. Alarcon's idea. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Okay, so we got our recommendations. Roberto, what's next? Um, that would be item six, Councilman. It's a report from the Planning Commission. It's a zone change. It has to deal with the demolition of an existing office building and the construction of a proposed off, um, three-story building with office space and a coffee shop in CD4, and staff is present. Okay, welcome. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Linda Smith, um, excuse me, <coughs> with the LA City Planning Department. On December 11th, 2007, the Central Area Planning Commission approved a zone change from QR3-1 to TQC4-1 uh, for properties located at 715 through 731 South Curson Avenue within the Wilshire Community Plan area. The Q conditions that were tied to that zone change request limited the development on the site to a 26,000 square foot office building with a 2,860 square foot roof deck and an 800 square foot coffee shop. Additionally, the hours of operation were limited to Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. and for use of the patio area, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., allowing for three times a year that the use of the patio area be allowed until 10 p.m. at night. Uh, in addition, the height on the building was limited to 49 feet and 6 inches, and a medium, minimum of 112 parking spaces were required. Um, apparently, after the APC decision was made, an ownership change occurred on the property. Um, this ownership change did not, however, affect the zone change decision or the Q conditions that were tied uh, through the commission's decision on December 11th. Uh, so my understanding the applicants are here and can probably explain better uh, the events that occurred with the changing of the property. Okay. M let me ask uh, Renee Weitzer here from the council office. If you can give us a perspective here because of the conditions and situation of this case. Right. I've asked the city clerk to pass uh, around to you an article from the Los Angeles Times. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Renee Weitzer for Councilman Tom LaBange. When this first came, when this application first came to us, we had uh, met with the community and had done a great deal of work 
uh, they had requested a zone change on a piece of residential property. Uh, this business was on Wilshire Boulevard and went down Kursan, and the residential property is on Kursan. Uh, we had agreed with the community to support the zone change at that time because we wanted to retain the business. Uh, we wanted to give them an opportunity to expand, and that was the reason why we supported the zone change. Shortly after that, uh, prior to coming to the Area Planning Commission, we discovered that the property was for sale. Uh, we had reservations regarding it. However, when it came to the Area Planning Commission, we did end up supporting it. Since then, uh, drastic changes have occurred. As you can see, the article from the paper, the business has gone bankrupt. It is no longer there. The doors are closed. They've let 500 employees go the night before with a simple email. Um, it is a strong belief that there is no reason for us at this time to zone change a residential property from R3 to C4 in as much as it is not for the benefit of this business which does not exist. However, it is now owned, or I'm not sure if it is owned, it's owned by a hedge fund. And uh, in our estimation, we don't believe that we need to do a zone change of a residential property for a hedge fund or whoever it is. It's not this business. It's not expanding. It's not there. They've done a disservice to the community. And we would like to kill the zone change, to put it bluntly. OK. Thank you very much. Can you be any clearer, Ms. Weitz? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, we do have several speaker cards on this item. We have um, David Moss. Jerry Hernandez and James O'Sullivan, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Reyes, members of Plum. I'm David Moss, 613 Wilshire Boulevard, Suite 105 in Santa Monica, California. I am the project, management, uh, project manager for this project. Despite the change of ownership, we're here before you to tell you, one, that we think that staff has done an admirable job in looking at the issues. We think that we have an excellent track record of working with the community. We have never stood before you on odd side of the table, so to speak, from any council office in the city, so this is an uncomfortable situation. But what I am here to assure you of is the following. The current owner of the property has given us their um, full um, go ahead to not make any changes to the entitlements that were requested, nor the project design that has been approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. They are committed to a project on an 18,000 square foot R3 piece of property that will continue to be in the future, whether it's for Axiom, which it now won't be, or for any other business owner, a very substantial, highly designed building that the neighborhood and the council office, despite the change of ownership, have agreed is a wonderful building. The parking is in excess of what's required. The driveway design has been done to the satisfaction of the neighborhood. All of the city departments are recommending approval. So again, I stand before you in a very uncomfortable situation. And that is that um, we respectfully request that the Plum consider the approval of this zone change in light of the fact that Q3 Q condition number three could not be clearer. It took an hour of discussion before the Planning Commission. It is quite clear to anyone who reads it that it sets forth a requirement to build exactly this building in exactly this location with the height massing setback and parking that's been requested. And again, we respectfully request that this project be considered for approval and passed the City Council. Thank you, Mr. Moss. I, re I read very clearly here. It says, only if needed, Jerry Hernandez. So. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, unless my colleagues have a reason to call Mr. Hernandez, I don't see a reason for him. In his own writing, he says only if needed. So. That's correct. But if there are questions from um, council staff or the council office, we are available to answer those questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. James O'Sullivan. Name and address, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, council members. James O'Sullivan, 907 Maslin Avenue. I'm the president of the Miracle Mile Residential Association. 
yes, this is awkward. I mean, the community met with uh, Mr. Moss and uh, with a group of people over a two-year period of time. Um, as we do with all issues, we know something's going to be built on a property, and we try to get the best for the community. Uh, we had several public meetings. Um, and as uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Weitzer talked about, you know, we, we approved this based on that we knew or felt that it was going to enhance Axiom, which was an active property in the area. Um, we went through several design changes um, and came up with a building that we, we were really excited about. We became concerned, as Ms. Weitzer said, when we heard that it was on the market and then subsequently my concern is it's now in basically going through a bankruptcy and I'm a little concerned that that this particular the approval of this will enhance the property in a bankruptcy issue I don't know who's coming in there and a lot of the approval for the community had to do with the the company that was coming in and assurances that that they've made Mr. Moss I have a great deal of respect for um, but I don't know who he's representing at this particular point we have 1,000 units coming in, mixed-use uh, units in the Miracle Mile. We've worked hard with developers. We've worked hard with the business community. Uh, we're trying to really bring it back to its heyday, and we think that we're quite a ways there. But I'm very uncomfortable, as I think the council office is dealing with a ghost, because we don't know what's going to go in there, and that will impact it. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, colleagues, it seems like there's the notion of confidence and uh, trust when you talk about this type of zone change. There are amenities and requirements that come along with it, and uh, it's clear to me that the council office is not in a position to maintain what was originally conceptualized and let it go back to what it was before by denying the zone change. Because of that, notion of commitment in terms of what was being presented. So Mr. Moss, I appreciate the awkwardness here too. It's not often I come across a case like this. But um, colleagues, any, any input, any observations? I have a, just a general question not really related to this, but what's the standard for the city to do his own change, city attorney? There's some Martian speaking right now. I'm sorry. That was, that was, I think the UFOs landed on top of City Hall. Yeah. <laughs> Someone understood it. <laughs> For the record, Sharon Cedar of Gardner's City Attorney's Office. Um, when you say the standard, the standard of review. For well, right. What, what's the language I'm looking for? Um, you know under, what I mean. <laughs> Um, zone changes are governed by the zoning code, which sets forth findings that have to be made in order to grant a zone change. Under state law, the zone change has to be consistent with the land use designation of the general plan. In this case, both the R3 and the requested zone to C4 are consistent zones. Um, and then, of course, because it's a discretionary action, there needs to be a CEQA review. Um, so, Basically, at this point, in order to uh, deny the zone change, you would have to come up with new findings and possibly ask the planning department to look at the CEQA analysis to determine whether the mitigated negative deck that was done for a known project would be sufficient for the same office building if you didn't know what was going in there. Does that We'd answer your question? We'd have to find new questions? findings, right? To, to, if we wanted to find, okay. I'd uh, motion to deny the... Uh, I, I don't know if you have any questions. This, no, I have any more questions. I, I appreciate you know, your question to our city attorney. So um, I would agree that uh, we would deny the request for a zone change based on findings that this planning department would have to articulate as a result of this discussion in terms of the notion of compatibility and consistency. Um, and we can go from there. We okay? okay We're all okay. All right. Okay. It's one of those okay days. All right, folks. That'll be the action of this committee. Thank you.
Roberto, next item. Uh, next item, Councilman, is an appeal by Ethel Investment Group, and they're appealing the approval of a zone change ordinance, uh, which was made by the North Valley APC, and it has to do with the construction of a new 12,400 square foot office light manufacturing building in CD2. And this item number is? Uh, 10, Councilman. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, co uh, council members. My name is Kevin Jones. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry. Um, I was the uh, hearing officer that was appointed to conduct a public hearing on behalf of the uh, North uh, Valley Area Planning Commission um, that rendered their decision on January 3rd. Uh, this involves property at uh, seven, uh, 7525 and 7535 North Ethel Avenue. Uh, the project was a zone change uh, from QP1 to C and CM-1 to uh, TQ CM-1. Um, the commission considered the uh, recommendations which recommended approval of the zone change to TQ CM-1 um, and imposed all the conditions. However, uh, during the proceedings by the uh, commission on January 3rd, they made some revisions specifically um, in, in, in talking with the applicant as well about the hours of operation of the, uh, of the facilities there and uh, what you have before you as the result of that. You will notice that in condition number 21 that the hours of operation were tailored to address the applicant's concern about um, an existing building that had tenants in it and uh, what we tried to do or what we wanted to do and what the Commission advised us to do was to consider that this property is immediately adjacent to single-family residential uses to the north. As such, that was the reason for our iteration of, of the hours of operation and their limitation. Considering the applicant's uh, concern about the existing tenants, the uh, commission then asked us to make some changes to the hours of operation to allow the existing tenants with leases to operate in their, in their existing format, which is why you now see that there is a specific date as to when the entire site would have to comply with the overall hours of operation. In addition, the commission asked us to to, ins to um, include a wall between on the north side of the property to also provide another buffer to the residential uses to the north. Um, those are the that is the reason for the uh, appeal. I believe that the applicant might have some other operate. Um, have some other presentation to that. I did bring some photographs for you to observe if you need, um, but I'll step aside for any questions. Okay. Any questions for our staff? Seeing none. Okay, so the appellants, who are the appellants? Like to come on up? Give us your name and address. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Robert Lamashaw with JPL Zoning Services, 6263 Van Nuys Boulevard, representing uh, Ethel Investment, the applicants. Uh, the property owner and the architect are both here who can answer questions if there are additional concerns or questions. The, um, the problem that the uh, developer has with this site really deals with the two specific conditions, number 21 and number 26. The primary issue really is the hours of operation for number in condition number 21. At the commission hearing, one of the issues that was brought up was, as you can see from the exhibits that I'm sure that you have, uh, abutting to the north are a series of single family zones. And there was uh, concern expressed by staff that uh, an operation, business operation here, uh, could be noisy and uh, present potential problems. I believe that staff was um, overzealous in their interpretation of the uh, protections necessary for the adjacent single family for any number of reasons. One of which is the existing building which is on this property has been here for over 30 years. There's never been a complaint. This type of use is a CM use. It is a light industrial office type use. And based on the code requirements in the CM zone, 
It basically eliminates a lot of the types of businesses and industries that the neighbors express concerns in, heavy machines operating until late hours. Um, the CM zone doesn't permit that. It basically limits these uh, types of machines to smaller, to smaller uh, shops. And as it happens, the tenants in the existing building, and we believe the tenants in the new building, are primarily um, sort of commercial type of uses. We have people in there who, uh, there's an accountant. There's somebody who uh, distributes crayons to schools. There's a, a film editor. These are, are fairly quiet, non-impact of businesses. And many of them have to be open at night because very often, for example, the film editing and the crayon distribution um, does a lot of the office work at night and then runs the business during the but day. The bottom line is that the uses are not, in your opinion, going to be generating a level of noise that's going to be disruptive to the residential area. That's correct. That's your assertion. Yeah. Okay. The other, I mean, the other point I'd like to make, if I may, is that the, the city's noise ordinance does indeed control uh, obnoxious noises at hours. In fact, if this project were being developed as a mini-mall, um, under the mini-mall ordinance, they could be open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., far beyond the hours that basically the commission had limited. I think they were way overzealous on that. Can you speak to the hours in which ingress and egress for trucking, shipping and receiving, can you address that point? Certainly. We have no problem in limiting the hours for shipping and receiving to uh, reasonable types of hours, uh, basically, uh, you know, from 7 in the morning to, say, 7 at night or something along those lines, so that people on the uh, adjacent residence, those types of uses will indeed uh, not be impacted at night. But a lot of our clients do operate at night and quietly, but need to be able to be there. But we're talking about trucks, correct? At trucks, we have no problem in providing reasonable limitations for uh, delivery. And in fact, I believe current LA City Code does limit the hours during which um, deliveries can take place. OK. Anything the else other, you'd like to add? The, the other issue regards the um, condition dealing with the fence, um, number 26. I would like to submit uh, some exhibits for you to take a quick look at. Um, basically, where there's not a fence or along the new development, we don't have a problem with creating one. But the um, portion of the property where the existing building is, is very well landscaped. The photos which I've just submitted show that portion of the property right through there, which is the existing building. Um, we believe to tear out all that landscaping to put in a solid block wall is neither attractive or beneficial to, uh, to the neighbors. And again, there's never been a complaint from those neighbors about the wall, the hedges, the, um, the noise, or any problems with the existing site. I think to some extent, uh, staff was kind of looking for a, an answer to a problem that didn't exist. And we would uh, submit that uh, where there's an existing wall that remains, where the landscaping is here, it just be left alone. That's much more attractive than putting up a block wall and would not provide any additional protection. Okay, thank you, sir. We have Murray Siegel and Gary Siegel. Would you like to come forward? And then Olga Kayarte. The project architect. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add, sir? Excuse me, sir? Anything else you would like to oh, add? Yeah, yes, Murray Siegel, uh, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. Um, I reside, or my office is located at, uh, in Calabasas, 5101 Douglas Fir Road. I'm the architect and uh, for the project. <clears throat> I feel the two issues in mind, uh, as was brought out before me, was the wall. And there does exist a fence along the property line where the landscaping is at the existing 300 feet. And it's just that it isn't masonry, but the new section, 300 feet, does have a masonry wall, which will also be landscaped with trees all along there. In addition, I'd like to mention that the type of tenants in these buildings are small tenants. The whole space amounts to uh, 1,300 square feet per tenant. 
And it's true, some of them could be double that, but they're still basically small users, and they're of a very quiet nature. If you go out there, you don't hear a thing, and I know it's not to say it would continue that way in the future, but we feel it does not encourage large uses with uh, presses. And again, as was mentioned, the CM zone does restrict that also. So I feel that uh, what we're doing is very appropriate, or what we're asking for is reduction of hours uh, so that the, the people could operate at their own free will. Hey. I see. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Our next speaker. Then Olga Kearte. I'm sorry, one more than yourself. Almost there. Good afternoon. My name is Gary Siegel. I'm at 5101 Douglas Fir Road in Calabasas. I wanted to further expand on the type of tenants we have leased to for 30 years. These are very, very small businesses, often family businesses that have previously operated out of their home and have grown into a building with small and light industrial type units such as ours. We've operated the building, we built the building, and we're very proud of the work we do. We check our tenants out extremely thoroughly and operate and manage the property in a very hands-on way. So I wanted to submit all that to you and open uh, up any questions you might have of us and the history of the building, and it should continue on as it's been in the past. Well, currently my, my suggestion would be that we look at the loading and unloading of trucks and suggest certain hours that would be compatible to the residential nature of the area. And since we don't have the council office here, I'd like to run that by them because they're the ones who are going to take all the phone calls for all the disturbances should they occur. We have been uh, fortunate to have had good neighbors, and we believe we've been very good neighbors, so right. I'm sure if these hours are reasonable for deliveries and, and pickups from the businesses, it will work out fine. And that's the key word, what is reasonable? And so I'd like to recommend, well, as soon as we finish the discussion, but the direction I'll be suggesting is that we set hours that are more specific for the actual trucking Loading and unloading, ingress, egress. Um, also, trash pickup would be a concern for the kind of noise. And I'll be asking the staff to identify that. Right. And by the time this gets to council, should there be any changes by the council office for the trucking hours, that will come to light by then. So at this time, um, I just want to make sure that we are in agreement with the notion of what's reasonable. Uh, I'd like to suggest 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. as reasonable hours. For trucking? For, for all pickups and deliveries, trucking. Okay, well, thank you for that suggestion. Okay. Any, do you have any questions? I don't have any more questions. Okay. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Olga Quiarte. Yes, hi. My name is Olga Kirarte, and I live one, at 1314 Keswick um, in North Hollywood, right behind um, the proposal project. And I'm here uh, because I'm against the proposal altogether. Um, I will give you later on 125 signatures of neighbors that are against this proposal, and I'm going to read my statement. That way I can get uh, right to the point. Yeah, just uh, keep your eye on the clock. Yes. My understanding is when a fair argument has been made that a proposed project will have significant environmental effects, then it can only be approved after a full environmental impact report has been made. In this case, we have submitted full environmental impact report. I'm sorry. Uh, in this case, we have submitted submitted uh, documentation concerning the saturation levels of emission that are specific to light manufacturing and they are all at the highest level of measurements except one lead uh, uh, which is at the second highest level of measurement. The developer hired an expert who said that the measurements were um, that we were talking about will probably come from the freeway. The only problem with this is that the, um, the measurements of the air between our neighborhood were um, 
where the proposed development will be made and the freeway is significantly less saturated than the, air, the, air, uh, the area of the proposed development. The mitigated negative uh, declaration MND, MND only addresses the conditions as they will exist during construction, not the totality of the project once the 10 light manufacturers are up and operating. The MND does not address the additional emissions that will be coming from 60 feet away from our homes with, an air, with the air vents aimed at our homes. Um, there's a general plan for the neighborhood. It's residential. The city proposed a restriction on hours of operation, yet the developer does not want the restrictions. The hours of operation need to be limited. This is a residential neighborhood, not a dedicated industrial park. And so with that, I just want to say that you just consider that. Um, I have more to say, but then I also prepared a statement so you can all look at it later on. Thank you. And uh, can I also give you the 125 signatures of... Uh, yes, Please provide them to the clerk. Thank you, Ms. Gallarte. That completes the public comment period. Please come on over. In providing more flexibility for the building operation, What's the range of hours that would allow for that, for more flexibility? Um, first, let me answer a couple of questions. Um, you, there was an earlier question about trash and delivery pickup. Yes. Um, condition number five addresses the trash element, but does not talk about actual deliveries to it, just so that you will know where that element is from. Or that there are hours included in here about the removal of trash from the site. Great. Going back to your other question, uh, just so that you'll know that that's there. Um, also, in, there is the mitigated negative declaration also included discussion about uh, the public's concern about air pollution, and there is a, a condition that requires the installation of air filtration. So um, that was addressed in the mitigated negative declaration. That was uh, part of... So can you give me a set hours that could provide more flexibility for the operation? Um, in answer to your question, we felt that the hours that are contained in this report of 7 to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday, and 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. were reasonable. Um, that was considered by the Commission, and we felt that that was a reasonable amount. If you would like to expand them, of course, you can do so. Yes, and that's what I'd like to do. So we went to 10 p.m., um, the uh, hours of operation, for this building, what would be a typical in uh, any other building? Um, had this been located, the problem is, is that it's immediately adjacent to the residential uses immediately to the north. That's what the real problem is. Uh, we understand that this owner of this particular property currently is probably a, is a good um, landowner. The question that was posed at the commission is what happens when the property is sold to another person? So therefore, then we don't know how the operation will be conducted, which is why we imposed these specific hours of operations. The uses that are being promoted under the zone aren't the type of uses that generates the kind of noise. Not as far as presses and mechanical equipment, but then the, the concern that the commission had and that the community has is about other uh, commercial manufacturing uses that could go in there that generate more noise, not at the M1 uses, but there are increased noise levels as compared to what's there now. Well, let me put it this way. I'd like to recommend that the operations go to 10 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. and that we are more restrictive with the truck loading and unloading hours, so that's restricted to 4 p.m. instead of 7. And if the council office wants to change it, they can change it at the council floor. Again, because they are the ones that will be taking the calls and responding to this issue, hopefully they are more in tune with what the constituency wants. But I'm trying to find the middle ground here. I understand. 
And so we um, went however, to, we, ne we did not receive any comments from the council district prior to the preparation right. of these conditions. So again, I'm trying to address, and again, if everyone leaves, leaves here a little unhappy, I think I did my job. So not everyone gets what they want. So if we go to 10 p.m. in operations and loading and loading to 4 p.m., then we have a recommendation on that condition. Uh, condition 26, are there any observations on that, colleagues, about the wall? I think the issue of landscaping would suffice. The need for a wall seems to be a little overdone there. So if we can just go with the landscaping and the fence, I think that could meet the objectives of the project and be consistent with the needs of the community. Just so that you'll know that the wall also came from the commission's actions after hearing the, um, the, the discussions from the, the public. So they took that into consideration. But I that was not that. part of the original staff report. I appreciate that. And again, the council office can always change these conditions and council should they want to be more restrictive. Anything else, colleagues? Okay, so that'll be the action of this committee. So the action is grant and pardon. Deny in part. Deny in part. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, we got to give a microphone that works. And recommend the adoption of the ordinance for the zone change. There you go. When you specify the hours, Councilman, do you want to specify the days of the week? Is it Monday through Friday? Yes. Okay. And on the weekends, I believe, that's every day. And how about the weekends? Is it going to be different for the weekends? We'll keep them shorter on weekends. Okay. To 7 p.m.? All right. Okay. All right. Next item, Roberto. Um, item 11, Councilman, is an appeal by Sabrina Beskus, and she's appealing the decision of the Central APC as it relates to a, the approval of a track map for a 15-unit condo, and C, uh, the planning department is present. <laughs> Maya Zaitsevsky, planning. Uh, this is an appeal of the Central APC's denial uh, of the previous appeal and the sustaining of the advisory agency's approval for a 15-unit condominium with 37 parking spaces. Uh, the appeal points remain uh, generally the same from the, the appeal heard by the Central APC. Um, the main issue is the appellants are uh, tenants in an apartment building next door to the subject property. Uh, for about 10 years, the subject property was vacant and was used as a parking lot that the uh, um, tenants use for parking in their apartment building. The, uh, the lots were always two separate lots with two um, I think at one point it was one owner at recently as of I think May 2007 the owner of the subject property sold it to, to the um, applicant the applicant proposed a condominium project um, for about six months the site was vacant um, the tenants in the building who were previously parking there were told that they they no longer could park there they filed a complaint with the housing department and they filed a civil lawsuit against their uh, their um, landlord uh, the housing department looked into the claims and they determined that the rent should be prorated to um, uh, account for the loss of the parking that was previously provided they closed the case um, the lawsuit is still pending that they filed against their landlord what they would like in the appeal is uh, for the uh, city council to impose a condition on this tract owned by a separate property owner requiring them to provide 22 additional parking spaces for the apartment building next door. Um, they also claim that the MND was inadequate because it didn't analyze the loss of parking. At the time the MND was prepared, the parking lot had been vacant for about six months. We did an addendum to the MND in February and analyzed the previous use as a parking lot and um, concluded that there was no significant parking impacts. Uh, I recommend that you deny the appeal and sustain the decision of the Central Area Planning Commission. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have Sabrina Vinskis, I believe the appellant? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had more than two minutes, so I Don't guess I have to... You'll get more than two minutes. Um, hold on. Hi, my name is Sabrina Venskis. I'm actually representing tenants. I'm a, a land use attorney and I'm representing uh, 21 tenants, 1055 Wilshire Boulevard. 
Suite 1660 LA90017. Really, the issue is not about these tenants, whether the tenants are impacted. It's a question of whether or not this uh, community, the Hollywood community, this neighborhood is impacted. The existing parking lot where this project is proposed was built specially for the apartment complex in the middle of last century. And it's always been used for the tenants of the existing rent control building for since it's been was built and I believe it was built back in the 60s. There's a reason why Los Angeles Municipal Code section 12.21A4M says off street automobile parking spaces being maintained in connection with any existing main building or structure that is the apartment building where the tenants live shall be maintained so long as the main building or structure remains unless an equivalent substitute number of spaces are provided. What we're asking today is for this council, for, for this body to condition the approval of the condominium project in which the developer wants 15 condominiums to condition that they set aside the number of parking spaces that they've removed by building on this parking lot, set those aside, and maybe build a few less condominiums. They want 15, maybe build 12 but set aside the requisite number of parking spaces for the tenants that have lost, lost the parking. And we think that that is a fair, it, it's a way to give everybody a win-win solution. The parking continues to be maintained, the developer gets to build some condominiums, provide housing for Los Angeles, and make a profit. Can you, when you refer to, you know you have more time, right? Okay, can we stop the clock for a second if you have a question? The, 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 go ahead. Don't okay. worry, don't worry. Okay, so you didn't have a question. I just want to make sure. No, I, no, okay. I want to make sure you can... Okay. The other thing that we want to um, propose is that the city exempt the developer from the two parking space per new unit requirement and um, require only one space per unit for the new condominiums. And what that would do is that would actually be consistent with the surrounding other affordable apartment buildings, which right now, if you look at this particular apartment building in which I'm representing the tenants and the other affordable buildings around in this neighborhood, there's really only one space per unit required. So if you let the developer off the hook from providing two parking spaces per unit, they want to build 15 condos and only require them to have one, that you know, frees up more space to make sure that we're not losing parking in this area. I think that's the key. Parking is so bad. City needs to maintain what it's got. Okay. Those Thank are, you. Those are your main points. Thank you. Um, when you. I'm sorry, one question. When you mentioned off-street parking, were you referring to public street parking or private property parking? Private private par property parking. Okay, thanks. Um, we have with us uh, Eric Charbillo, Stephen Croy, and Timothy Miskell, I believe. Come on up, give us your name and address. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Carmelo, and my address is 1842 North Cherokee Avenue. Apartment 402, that's Hollywood, California, 90020A. Now, I moved into the property, 1842 North Cherokee, um, seven and a half years ago. And upon moving in, one of my caveats was that parking was provided. And there was an addendum in my lease that distinctly gave me a parking space in the unit that was included in my rent. At the time, uh, the area was just beginning to become gentrified, so parking seven years ago was difficult, but as you know, over the last several years, it's become more gentrified with um, uh, clubs and bars such as Geisha House and Mood and restaurants like um, Katsuya opening in the area. Um, it's, it's become overly saturated and, and street parking essentially has become nil. So when the parking uh, lot was sold last year, 37 uh, spaces were taken away, which left the tenants with the option of either parking on the street, which was really not an option, or parking in a private garage. So most of us found parking two blocks away in a private garage that was owned by the city. At the time it was $85 for monthly parking privileges, since then it's gone up to 100 However, the caveat there is parking is not guaranteed. So even though you're paying $100 a month, it's provided on a first come first serve basis and it's not guaranteed. So needless to say, you know, several times during the week, 
I come home from work late at night, and even though I've paid $100 in parking, I can't park in a garage that I just paid for. So again, displaced with parking and have to search on the street. So, you know, it's, it's an issue that's not just affecting the tenants of 1842, it's affecting the entire area, because when you're taking away 37 uh, parking spaces, you're taking away 37 spaces on the street. And I've had uh, neighbors complain constantly, saying that parking has truly become a nightmare and it affects their willingness to go out. Um, I guess that's my time, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Croy, and I'm also a tenant at 1842 North Cherokee, next door to the property in question. And I just wanted to say, like Mr. Camillo, that um, this sale of this lot and elimination of our parking spaces has impacted myself and my neighbors greatly due to the fact that, as Eric said, there really is no available street parking due to the number of buildings on the street that have no parking. Everyone there has to park on the street. So those of us who used to have parking are now fending for ourselves with parking as well. Um, I'd like to reiterate what, what Mr. Carmelo said about the fact that if you, if you choose to purchase a monthly parking permit in a, in a public parking garage like the one down the street, you're not necessarily guaranteed a space. They're not assigned spaces. And often um, you come home and find that you don't have a place to park even though you've paid for it. You have to go several blocks away and find something else and then walk home five or six blocks um, uh, in an area that is questionable for its safety in the middle of the night. Um, I've lived at the building for almost nine years and um, I had the parking space um, guaranteed to me by uh, my lease in the in the lot next door, which was the lot for that building at that time, <coughs> and have just now lost it since the sale of the lot. I see. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, Mr. Misko. That will be our final speaker. Then we'll have uh, the council office representative. Hello, my name is Timothy Misko. I live at 1842 North Cherokee, apartment 405. Um, like Eric and Stephen before me, I've lived in the building for eight years. And when I moved in, parking was guaranteed in my lease. Um, since that time, there really has never been a problem until our old landlord sold to the new landlord. And subsequently, they decided to sell our parking lot to a developer to build um, condominiums. Since that time, parking has been uh, not only a nightmare, but it's been a source of stress and frustration, not only for myself, but for other people in the building, um, many of which are elderly and as well, we have quite a few handicapped people in the building. So it adds the stress of having a parking lot next door to parking two or three blocks away or not being able to park at all. Um, many of these people are also, um, we have a rent controlled apartment and um, low income, so therefore we only not everybody's, I disagree, not everybody's rent has been reduced um, by the city, so they're therefore incurring more expenses to pay for extra parking, and if a parking space is not available when we come home, it's anywhere from 8 to $20 to park in a neighboring lot, and that can happen several times a week, so that has also affected us. Many of the people who lived in the building and have been residents of the area for years who frequent the buildings are getting concerned, they're getting stressed, and considering moving, but there's not affordable housing, as you know, in Los Angeles right now. Um, and many of us can't afford to. I'm a, you know, I work in the TV business. We just went through a writer strike, and therefore I don't have any extra money to afford to move. And uh, to have to pay for parking several times a week on top of my rent is become a situation which has become detrimental to me. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Miskell. So, so if you'd like to come on up, I didn't have a card for you, so they did. Well, come on up. Give us your name and address. I already went through all my cards. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerome Buckmelter, 23534 Etna Street, Woodland Hills, 91367. I'm representing the owner of the subject property. Um, the attorney, um, Steve Hoffman, will speak next, and he will indicate that... Um, that this case really shouldn't be before you because the opposition really has to do with a legal matter between the neighbors next door and the landlord next door, not, not the subdivider of this property. Uh, 
we had nothing to do with the sale of, this, uh, 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 the, the, uh, sale of the property. I mean, I'm talking about the, uh, the, the, the owner bought the property. He was an innocent purchaser of this property next door to this apartment building. And the appeal itself does not address the track map, which is before us. It involves, as I said, a court case having to do with parking and, and, and the landlord next door. And we're not party to that court case. Now, the track map before you was approved by the West, I'm sorry, Hollywood Hills West Neighborhood Council, and the approval letter is in the file. The advisory agency approved this project and made all the requisite findings according to the State Map Act. The Planning Commission approved this unanimously, five to zero, and we're not asking for any variances, adjustments, or exceptions because this project is consistent with the general plan, it's consistent with the zoning. So we just ask that you do not allow the opposition to hold this case hostage, and we ask that you deny the appeal and approve the track map. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I apologize. I didn't get your cards on a different item, but thank you. It's okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Steve Hoffman, attorney for the uh, applicants, uh, Quarters Investments, LLC. Uh, we've submitted a written uh, response dated April the 1, 2008. I, I hope that you all have that, but I want to run through a few points nonetheless. Okay. Uh, first of all, this was this property was not built as a parking lot. We have attached to our letter an actual printout. Uh, let's see, exhibit number number two to our packet, which distinctly shows that this was built as an ordinary property and it was torn down in the, let's see, in, in the 70s, I believe, first of all. Secondly, there's no precedent ever where there's a separately mapped lot bought by a bona fide purchaser with nothing recorded on it as being now used as a parking lot with some kind of right. There's no such thing. It's an unlawful taking without consideration. There's no such thing. The leases were never recorded on any properties. We bought a gated, locked up property it's been gated and locked for over a year now. And, and essentially, the claim of the tenants that they actually have these rights is fallacious in and of itself, frankly. We have obtained some leases. And the actual leases are attached uh, as exhibit number, let's see, exhibit number three to our packet. First of all, the samples we have, including the lead claimant, don't even provide for parking. They say no parking, first of all. So this is completely fallacious by itself. Number two, the lease has stated specifically on paragraph four that the parking rights are only upon the owner's property and are terminable upon seven days' notice. There's alternative parking on the same block, not blocks away. We've attached photographs of that lot as well as a lease. And what I find fascinating is, is that what the tenants are saying is that the point of lease resistance I assume I have more time because Ms. Venskis also had more time. Actually, the appellant has more time. You want to summarize and finish? I will summarize, appreciate yes, it. If, I, if I could. Uh, the fact remains is that we're a separate property. Nothing recorded on us. They dismissed their case against us because they have no case against us. Uh, there's alternative parking nearby. The city has closed this matter, and uh, the tenants have been paid to the extent they, they have made any complaints about this. And, the, and also the neighborhood council favors this project. And, uh, and, and just on its face, the lease doesn't even provide for parking. And if it does, they have the right to reassign the parking. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Ms. Weitzer for the grand finale. Renee Weitzer for Councilman Tom LaBange. Uh, this is sort of a difficult issue. Our hearts always say, go with the tenants. We always try and support tenants. In this particular case, I really don't know what to do because there's, it's an old building in Hollywood that has no parking. There are tons of uh, buildings uh, all over the city that were built many, many years ago without any parking. There was a vacant lot next door, which, was, which they used for parking. Was there a real car in front of it? <laughs> or a rail line? I'm not Tom LeBond, you know, I don't have a history. <laughs> Come on now. I'm not going to give How his speeches. How many feet from the curb? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to give his speeches. Um, so 
these tenants have been parking in a lot until it was closed off. I've reviewed some of their leases, and some of them say no parking. The leases all also say that if some of the tenants do have parking in that lot, it's they have seven days to give notice not to park there. So legally, I'm not sure that we can bind the new owner that purchased the vacant parking lot with their parking. That's one of the reasons why when we have new developments, we never reduce parking because there is a huge need for parking in the city. But I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Councilman. <laughs> never. But, Don't tell him never. <laughs> well, he has proof the pudding is here. <laughs> There's no parking. No, no, no. But, one uh, size does not fit all. That's Remember. true. I do agree yeah. with, you, with you that. I think I have talked about that. But in this particular case, even though we'd like to side with the tenants, we really don't know that legally we can do so and what the real answer to this is. Best I can do. Okay, so we can see you have the housing department involved and quite a few other entities from the city trying to engage the issue. Can I come on up? Maya Zetsevsky Planning. I just want to make a comment about um, their uh, representative's comment. Who, who's there? Sabrina okay. Ves, uh, Venskas. Okay. Uh, she suggested that you reduce the parking requirement in the condominium building and then also permit additional parking for the tenants in the building next door. And I just want to caution you that they have a re code required parking that they need to conform with. So you can't reduce it to less than the code required. And right now they're currently providing two and a quarter parking spaces consistent with the advisory agency's parking policy. So just run. Thank you for that. The uh, Madam Attorney, can you just give us the nuts and bolts on this one? Do we have the right to require and demand parking when the property is a separate entity? For the record, Sharon Cedar of Cardenas, I think before I answer that, you may want to ask Building and Safety um, about the issues regarding whatever parking is required at 1842 and whether that building complies with it. Mr. Long, where's your hat? <laughs> <laughs> I just had it a minute ago, so okay. forgive me. There it is. Uh, <laughs> for the record, Dave Lara with Billy and Safety. Good afternoon, council members. Um, we, we just found out about this particular case earlier, and we did some research on the project. and. Uh, what all, all we could really find on record, first of all, the, the pre-existing use at 1846 Cherokee, that uh, existing building, you know, showed its legality as, insofar as a, the existing apartments and uh, a mixed use of an apartment hotel, a coffee shop at one time, and so on. But there, we could not find any legal documentation that would actually tie parking with, between the two lots, whether that would be vis-a-vis -vis through a lot tie affidavit or through a normal parking affidavit. And these buildings, by the way, were constructed at a, at a time when uh, the Department of Building and Safety did not require parking to be noted on the permits because it was not really a requirement of parking, per se, other than for existing uh, single-family dwellings. Okay, so we don't have that on record. And given the code as you are interpreting it, it's not required on that site. Okay. So that is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, and Madam Attorney is, is, is shaking her head, saying yes. Okay, anything else you'd like to add, colleagues? Well, I too, understand and the plight that we're in, the lack of transportation and lack of parking. But it doesn't take away the fact that we are dealing with these property rights issues. And um, given the legal uh, requirements and interpretations, we'd like to follow the uh, recommendation of the staff and be consistent uh, with that report. And that will be the action of this committee. So okay, and in, in this case, council member, that would be to deny the appeal. Yes. Okay. And before we uh, go on, I don't think we have any public comment cards, so we're going to have 
Uh, are we going to hear items 12 and 13? Did you mention I'm sorry? Are we going to hear items 12 and 13? No. Okay. Uh, then I'd like to go back to uh, the previous item. It was item number 10 to make further clarification on the hours of operation. Uh, I understand that you want to modify them from 7 to 10 p.m., Monday through Friday, and from 8 a.m., I'm sorry, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday because the previous conditions requested that the business be closed on Sundays and legal holidays. But I want to make that clarification because I think we mentioned weekends as opposed to Saturday only. Right, so I'll just read the hours. Right, um, excuse me, Councilman. Um, make a motion to reconsider the item. We'd like to make and a then motion you can to modify. consider item 10 to clarify the conditions as stated. Hours operations 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturday. Truck deliveries from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday. Close on Sundays and legal holidays. Thank you very much. Okay. Did I get a Does second? Have a on second that? on that? Yeah. A okay. second. Right. Thank you. Okay. A weakening second. We're, we're losing ground fast. Energies are low. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Public comments. Mr. Weiss. <laughs> and I appreciate also the fact that we have the planning department coming to talk about on a regular basis because you've calendared this, was it 12 or 13 every week? Um, and I appreciate that. But what's not good is that they don't show. And there's a lot going on that you guys need to really know about that in your potholes and policy, you know, areas. I mean, it, it, I, I'd appreciate it if some consideration would be given to making the planning department show up and, and talk to you about this because you're by not by allowing them not to do that you're kind of communicating that you really don't care about it and I would respectfully I know you do <laughs> and I know that, that we need to do it there's a, there's really a tremendous amount for you that that you know I, I could relate to here um, but I don't want to speak for the planning department so I mean we, we've got certain administrative changes made the planning department's been really terrific about this we've got certain tenant protections now incorporated in demolitions uh, track map decisions we're going to work on conversions we're going to work on getting their um, forms basically updated in the conversion sense there's there, there, there's a lot going on and I really think it's important that the planning department be told by you and, and the rest of the committee that they need to show and talk about this 1295 Mr. Wesson's motion 1295 that was now a couple of years ago we, we need equalized treatment between conversion tenants and demolition tenants things of that nature um, if the pressure isn't on from from this body then they're not going to do it because they got a ton of things to do so if I would hope this is a policy. And the only last time I've ever heard a question raised about what the housing policy of the city should be was <clears throat> Mr. Weezar's comment in the debate when we raised the tenant relocation fees. And there was never an answer. And you know what? It's time to revisit it. And hopefully, again, you haven't forgot about that one too, Mr. Weezar, because we really do need a good, solid debate on what the housing policy of the city is. It's lacking. You guys need to do it. It's important. And I know you're up to it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiss. Anyone else here for public comments? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Get your library going. Uh.